Let's go ahead and go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And we're going to be going, I said 29, actually go to verse 35. Verse 35. So let's start in John chapter 1. Look at verse 35 with me. I'll read a few verses and then we'll, we'll go through this. So John 1 verse 35. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. I want to ask this question today. What is your response to Jesus? What is your response to Jesus? And we're talking today about encountering Jesus. This is a, a really cool moment in the book of John where, where before, you know, we, it's not Jesus' first appearance. We've talked about the Word but it's really the first appearance in the narrative, not just the build up to the story. And so we're going to see today the first really words that John, the disciple, thought were worthy to include here. The first interaction between Jesus and the disciples, really their first encounter with Jesus. And I want us to think for a second about that, that thought, that, that concept of a first encounter with something. Or just a, a significant encounter with something. Something I, I imagine in your life you've had lots of first-time encounters or significant encounters with something that was just kind of transformative. Something that just kind of shifted the way you, you thought of something. Or, or just it's something that you always think back to that it just sticks out in your mind. For mine, for some reason, I have a lot of uh, significant encounters with nature and not in a good way, not like in a peaceful, like, oh, isn't this beautiful way? But uh, I've had some of those too. But the ones that stick out in my mind, I've told you about some of them, like when I was on a mountain in Germany and I got attacked by bees. Told you about that one. Uh, I have a, a, an encounter with a crawdad that I can't tell you about from the pulpit. Um, it was a really unfortunate time. Actually, don't ask me about it. I'm not going to tell most of you. Um, I've had times where I had poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, got all sorts of different ones. Uh, just nature hasn't seemed to like me too much. I had a time where I walked through this bush and apparently it was just infected with ticks. And I had so many ticks on me that my mom was like, hey, you're getting a lot of freckles all of a sudden. They're just a bunch of seed ticks. So I had to have this nurse come to our house and remove all these ticks. So that was embarrassing and uh, shameful, but uh, had those types of things. I had this one time, and this is probably one of the reasons I hate spiders. Um, there's this spider at my parents' house when I was growing up, and I've never loved them, but I don't know if I was afraid of them until this moment. And there's this really big spider. And so, you know, I could have gotten a tennis racket or something, tried to smack it down, but that's not what I did. I tried to grab some sort of spray because you could do that a little more from a distance. So I just grabbed one, didn't, didn't really examine what I was picking up. Well, it wasn't a bug killing spray. It was Rust-Oleum and it was chrome. <laughs> so I sprayed this spider and I... I felt like, if you've ever seen the movie Terminator, where the ones come back and they're like liquid metal, if you spray a, a big spider with chrome rust-oleum, it looks like a Terminator spider. And so that has stuck in my mind uh, for a long time. We've also had some encounters, even in this building, with uh, critters. I had a, a mouse that found its way into my refrigerator, my little mini fridge in my office there, and he would just, every now and then, he'd peek his head out. And he'd come out, and that thing was fast. Man, I tried to catch him. I could not catch him. And uh, he did eventually uh, lose his life, poor thing. And, and when I got close to him, I realized he was actually really cute. And so I felt bad about that. Uh, but while he was running free, I just felt like it's on me, like all the time. It's like around me. That's how I feel when I'm around critters. Then there have also been, I'm told, I wasn't here at the time, two snakes that got loose somehow in our building. I'm just telling you, I wasn't here, and that's the only reason I'm still your pastor today. <laughs> and we apparently have a lady on staff who does not mind picking up snakes. Like, you all weren't shocked enough about that. There is a lady on staff who, like, will go and pick up snakes. That's just, I, I just think God designed snakes not to be picked up. It's just one of the most absurd things ever. It's like, what should we do with it? Pick up snakes is not like, pick the thing up. That's not on my list anywhere. 
Not nowhere at all. So I have encounters like that. We also have all sorts of other encounters. Like, like I'm sure what stands out in your mind if you've ever lost a loved one, your first encounter with the reality of death. Right? That, that's something that, and every time we lose someone we care about, it just, it's a formative experience. It, it just changes our whole existence. Our reality is different. And sometimes as we have an encounter, we have difficulty processing, how do I, how do I understand this new normal? What am I to do with this information? What am I to do with this, this change in life that life is different from now on? And then there's the encounter with Jesus. That, that while he's not here in the flesh, his spirit is here. The word of God is all about him. At some point in your life, You have been preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, so you encountered Jesus in that way. The truth of the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us, you experienced that. You had that encounter with the truth and the saving grace of Jesus. And what do you do with it? How do we process it? What is our response to being introduced to Jesus? So let's look back at our text, John chapter 1 and verse 35. It says the next day. So uh, I wonder if you remember that we're kind of in a sequence within the narrative where day one that starts this whole testimony of John the Baptist, it begins with the Jews questioning John the Baptist and asking, who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you the, the prophet? Are you the Messiah? And he says, I'm not. But then day two is when he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then he tells us about the one you see, the Spirit descending upon. This is the one. And so he gives us that testimony. So here we are in day three, and John's disciples are going to meet Jesus. So the next day, John, so again talking about John the Baptist, he was standing with two of his disciples. And we're going to learn the identity of one of those in a second. Verse 36, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. So this is the testimony that he's given to us. That's the Lamb of God. This is, this is the testimony that all those around would hear, and that's exactly what happened. Look at ver- uh, verse 37. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. Now this is an interesting thing. We're going to find out in a second that this is Andrew. He's one of these disciples. And what's interesting is the other Gospels record the actual calling of Andrew. And so this isn't the actual calling of Andrew. In fact, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 20 records when Jesus calls him. It says this, As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Or I was raised on the old King James. I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. So John doesn't record their actual calling here. It seems like their first interaction, which actually makes it make even more sense why they would just drop their nets and follow a guy who says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So John, though, he's recording what seems like their first encounter with Jesus. And what we're going to see, and what we see here in verse 37, it says they heard John the Baptist say this, and they followed him. That even though it's not the point in time where he says, follow me yet, they're just ready to go. That's the response. And I want to ask you, as you've encountered Jesus, are you ready to follow him? Do you resist him? It just stands out to me that all they had to do was hear the Lamb of God. He's here. And of course, they would have known what that meant, just like you and I. If we've been around church very long at all, we understand what Jesus means. We're not surprised by his identity. We're not surprised by what he expects of us. So we, having honestly even more knowledge than them, because we, we get to see it in the picture of history, they just, they're ready to get up and go. Are you ready to follow him? Or do you resist Jesus? Are you still resisting him? Maybe you're resisting him as Savior and Lord, and he's tapped on your heart and offered himself to you, and he's ready for you to surrender. Or maybe you've professed him as Lord and Savior, but your lifestyle resists him. 
You'd just say, well, there's things that I want to do, and I know he wouldn't be okay with that, but, but I want to do them. That's resisting him as the Lord, the master of your life. Now look at Jesus' response. Look now at verse 38. It says, when Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now, this, this, uh, this should be a, just a pause-worthy moment. He says, what are you looking for? These are the first words of Jesus spoken in John. Now, what's really interesting and just really powerful to me is John, the disciple, he admits later on in his book that he doesn't record every word. He says the volumes here couldn't be contained if I wrote down every single word of Jesus. So he's, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's given us some things that are specific to his point. And we know from later on in his book, his purpose is so that we can know about Jesus, who he is, and believe in him, and believing have life through his name. And so these aren't these aren't just words we ought to overlook. In fact, there's going to be three things here back to back to back that it is just such powerful. Uh, on the surface, it could be just an ordinary conversation. But behind the scenes, knowing what we know about Christianity, there is just so much power in the words here. So when Jesus, he's finally revealed here, John the Baptist says, there's the lamb. Look, the Lamb of God. He's the one. He's going to take away the sins of the world. The disciples, they hear him and they follow him. And Jesus notices them following him. Of course, he knew everything about them because Jesus is God. He knows they're inside, they're outside. He knows everything about them. And yet he says, what are you looking for? He didn't say, why are you following me? He could have said that. He didn't say, where are you going? What are you looking for? That's a powerful question. I just want to pose it to you for a second. What are you looking for? As, as you come to church, as you read the Word, what are you looking for? Sometimes we're looking for things like, I just want satisfaction, or I just want security, I want enough finances, I want pleasure, I want this or this or this. And then sometimes people get some or many or most of those things, and then they find themselves it's incomplete still. It's just, it's still not enough. I'm still dissatisfied. I'm still not happy. What are you looking for? Now, we know with the Jews, a lot of them were looking for a Messiah who would overcome the Roman Empire, and that's not what Jesus was going to be. He was going to set up a kingdom that would overthrow all or outlast all kingdoms because it's a spiritual kingdom. He wasn't going to necessarily release them from their physical bondage under the Romans. That's not what his goal was going to be. It was going to be to liberate them from their sin. What are you looking for? Are you looking for something just in this life that God heal my pains, heal my sickness, heal my sorrow? And I'm not belittling those things. I'm just saying all those things are temporary compared to what he actually offers. So what are you looking for? Now look what the disciples say at the rest of verse 38. They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now I wonder, there's lots of different translations, and um, it doesn't say here, where's your house? It's an interesting choice here, again, with John, which is why I think, and I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but I, I think these words have a double meaning for us. That word staying is the Greek word abide or uh, meno, which you'll see time and time again throughout the Gospel of John. In fact, one of the most key and pivotal passages as we go through John is about abiding in the vine, abiding in him. What are you looking for? Where do you abide, Jesus? Where do you abide? Where do you remain? To know that we, as if, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, are to remain in Him, to, to be with Him, to stay with Him. This very first interaction, what are you looking for? And they say, where do you abide? And He responds, look now at verse 39, come and you'll see. Now, again, this is just a simple interaction. If, if you're observing it without any of the spiritual connotation, it's just like, hey, what are you looking for? We're looking for your house. We want to go with you. We'll come and you'll see it. 
But if you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, what are you looking for? Jesus, I want to know where you abide. Come and you'll see. What a powerful thing to say. Now, sometimes we have things that keep us from truly following him. They're all ready. They're ready to go. He's going to give them their official calling when he sees them one day out fishing. He's going to give them their their actual calling of follow me, but their hearts are ready to follow him. But sometimes our hearts resist, whether it's resisting because we don't want to come to Christ at all, or we've said we've come to Christ, we're we're saying we're following him, but we don't want to give him everything. Matthew chapter 8 records how we often feel. In verse 18, it says this, when Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. A scribe approached him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Lord, another of his disciples said, First let me go bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury the dead, their own dead. Now, this, of course, has been, um, people hear that and they say, Oh my, he doesn't even want us to take time to bury people. That's not what he's saying. He knows the hearts of these individuals. Sometimes we're like the first person that we don't want to forsake our comfort. We don't want to forsake the things that we really like. And then sometimes we're like the second person that we just have things that we say, this is more important, this is more important, this is more important. And when we do that, we're not yielding everything to him. Now he doesn't, like like sometimes in scripture we see where he tells them to sell all their possessions. He hasn't commanded that for every person. But do possessions or anything, do they have a piece of our heart that we wouldn't offer to him? When we want... To follow Jesus, it means Savior and Lord. When they encounter Jesus, they're ready to forsake all, to give up all. Now that is a nice platitude, and sometimes we don't, we just think, well, yeah, they did that. The only reason we'd ever want to do that is if it's true. And if it's true, And we ask this question again, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? If you're looking for some earthly satisfaction, then yeah, he's not for you. If that's where you just want to fill up everything, but I just want to warn you that that will be temporary and it will disappoint. It will not bring the satisfaction that you think it'll bring. It won't, whether it's popularity or or if you think I'm just going to get fulfilled just in, in my marriage or in my wealth or my finances or my job or my title or or sexual pleasure or whatever it is, whatever you think, that'll be it. I'm telling you it won't. What are you looking for? You're looking to fill a void that only Jesus can fill. So number one in your notes is this. When you encounter Jesus, follow him. When you encounter Jesus, follow him. The story of Scripture is that Jesus Christ died to save you from your sins. He wants you to know Him. He wants to redeem you back into Himself. You don't have to do anything to get this except for to surrender to Him. And He asks you to do it in the same way He will ask these disciples to follow Him. He asks you to follow Him, to forsake all and come to Him. Now, he'll still have to work on you along the journey. When he calls his disciples, they weren't perfect. They said, okay, I'll follow you. Step one, perfection. That's not what happened. And it's not what will happen with us either. There's a path of sanctification where he makes us from what we are to what he wants us to be. There's a path of that in this life. But salvation is instant. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's instant. And he calls you to that today. He calls you to that today. And if you're a Christian who has that, he calls you today to live like that, to truly forsake. Now let's go on. Look now at verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. 
and he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. I've always said Cephas, but as I did research into that, I found out that sometimes as a Missourian, how I say things is not right, and I don't like it, but it's reality, which is translated Peter. So I want to ask this next question. I've asked you what happens when you encounter Jesus, and you ought to follow him. Well, what can happen when you follow Jesus? I wonder if you've ever seen someone truly transformed. Now, we see transformation just in the physical world all the time, right? We, we see someone who gets serious about physical fitness or someone who goes through college and on the other side, they seem like they've learned plenty or someone who takes a, a job and, and maybe they're in an apprenticeship and on the other side, they went in not knowing much and came out being ready to go into the workforce. We've seen those kind of transformations. I had a my, uh, my best friend growing up, he went into the Navy SEALs. I've talked about him several times. When he left, he was a skinny kid. When he came back, he put on like 20 pounds of muscle, and he was like, he was hard to recognize almost. Uh, when we, we went back to uh, Kentucky this last week, of course, they had seen my kids when they were really young, is eight years ago. And so it's really funny that now some of my children are, are taller than my youth members when they knew them as like babies. We see transformation all the time. But a true transformation can happen when you encounter Jesus. Look what happens. So first we have verse 40, Andrew. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like Andrew is a pretty prominent person in Scripture. And yet what's interesting is that he is only mentioned 13 times in Scripture in 12 verses. It's just really not that much. We know he's Simon Peter's brother. He's a fisherman. But one of the most important things that he does is what he does after he's introduced, verse 41, he first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Now, I could do a whole sermon on that alone, that he encountered Jesus, and he went and he found, and he told someone else. He told people who cared about him. I'm not going to focus on that today, but we ought to note it, that what he did when, when he encountered Jesus is not only did he follow, but he also went on an evangelistic mission to tell someone that he cared about. We ought to take note of that, and we ought to do that as well as we follow Jesus. But then we have Peter. So it says, Simon Peter's brother. It's a, just an interesting interaction. I mean, Jesus has just burst onto the scene in the Gospel of John, and one of the first things he does is change Peter's name. That's just really interesting. Imagine, imagine that your brother comes to you and says, we found the Messiah, and introduce, and, and it's like, hey, my name's Obi. And he's like, mm, it's not anymore. <laughs> I'm going to, got, got an easier to spell one than Obadiah Dalrymple. That'd be, that'd be an all right transformation. But it says in verse 42, and he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, you are Simon. Now, Simon is a pretty common name at the time. He says, son of John. Uh, this could be John. Uh, it could be our third John, really. But, but generally in Scripture, it's translated in other places, Jonas or Jonah. So Simon bar Jonah, or Simon son of Jonah. But so here, trans, it could be translated John as well. So we do kind of have our third John in this story, not confusing at all. And it says, you will be called Kephas. Kephas coming from the Aramaic word kepa, meaning rock. Now, what's interesting, when he calls him, um, he says, which is translated Peter, it's interesting that he, he gives him a name and then translated it immediately afterwards because John's doing this to help his audience, which he knew mostly wouldn't know Aramaic, which Kephas is. And so he translates it to Greek, Petros, meaning the same thing, rock. So he calls him there in the Aramaic, rock, or he, called, he says translated, here it is in the Greek, Peter, Petros, rock. And Peter would indeed be a foundational piece in the establishment of the Lord's church. Number two in your notes is this. When you encounter Jesus, he changes you. He changes you. Now, now I don't want to, again, over-spiritualize the changing of a name, although there is so much significance both in this culture, but also what we know Peter will be, a rock, a foundational piece 
in the establishment of the Lord's church, but that is not the only thing the Lord would change with Peter. When you encounter Jesus, he will change your purpose. I want you to consider Peter's call. In Mark chapter 1, verse 16 through 17, it says this, As he passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Peter was a fisherman. He went from a fisherman to an evangelist, willing to lay down his life for Jesus. Jesus will give you a new purpose. When you encounter Jesus, he will change your heart. Listen to the message. Peter, he will risk his life to preach. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we get a, a, a picture of this. When he preaches, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for their forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He went from a fisherman to giving sermons. He, he changed his heart to no longer, I'm out doing work, but now I'm out doing the Lord's work. He went to preaching. When you encounter Jesus, he will forgive you. Consider Peter's denial. John chapter 18, verse 26 and on records this. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, didn't I see you with him in the garden? Peter denied it again. So I didn't give you the whole story, but a portion of it. Immediately the rooster crowed. We know of Peter's three denials. And yet... After asking a series, a series of asking if Peter loves Jesus after the resurrection, Jesus re-enlists him into his service. We find this and we'll read it when we get there in John chapter 21, verse 18 and on. It says, truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. He gives them this news that it's going to be shocking to any of us that this is how you're going to die. Follow me. After Peter had denied, and Jesus goes, just like there's three denials, there's three statements, Peter, do you love me? Follow me. I'm grateful that he gives second chances. And despite my sin, he still calls me, he calls you to follow him. And then when you encounter Jesus, he will change your perspective. Imagine receiving that news that this is how you're going to die. Despite the fact that Peter was told he was going to die for the cause, he wrote these words in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-9. through 9, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time it is necessary you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Jesus will change you. He will transform you. And he invites you to follow him. Let's pray.